we'll go ahead and get started in a few minutes. Okay, we've got a few people um, ready to roll. Welcome everybody to Understanding Financial Aid at Reed. Um, my name is Sandy Sundstrom and I am the Director of Financial Aid here at Reed College. And I'm so glad that so many of you were able to take time today to find out more about um, financial aid. I'm gonna talk in generalities about financial aid, but give you a lot of specifics of how um, financial aid works um, here at Reed College. And what I thought we would do, I have a few slides that I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna do that rather quickly because I really wanna spend a lot of time, as much time as possible on answering your questions. So, um, we can do that um, at the end. So what I'd like you to do is as I'm speaking about something and you think about a question, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. And then when we get done with the, the formal presentation, we can go through the chat questions and address them at that point. Or then if you just wanna unmute yourself um, when we get to the Q&A section and ask your question, um, that works as well too. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna share my screen. And again, as you think of things, go ahead and put them in, um, in the chat. So under, understanding um, financial aid, uh, again, my name is Sandy Sundstrom. I am uh, the Director of Financial Aid um, here at Reed. And um, today's session is really meant to provide you with a pretty broad understanding of, of how financial aid works. Um, not, not all the nitty and gritty that might be different at different institutions, but I think it'll give you a good uh, basis of information and may actually spark more questions um, as you go through the process. So what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna talk about financial aid, the definition of what it is, um, the timeline of when you can expect things to happen as you go through your admission and financial aid application cycle. The types of financial aid um, and sources of where that aid comes from. We'll, we'll touch on how to apply for financial aid, um, some things that are going to be similar across colleges, as well as some that might be unique to that specific institution. Uh, we'll talk about how your eligibility is determined when we're talking specifically about um, financial aid that's based on your financial need. We'll talk about net price calculators. If you haven't explored those, that's a good tool that you can start um, using if you're um, a current, currently in high school, you can check out a net price calculator. And then um, if you've ever, I'm not sure if we have any parents in the room, but if, if parents, if you've ever filled out financial aid applications for your other children, um, you might've realized that it's not always um, clear where you would let the financial aid office know if you've had a special circumstance or a change in circumstances um, since your aid applications were completed. And then again, time for questions at the end. And I don't know why my slide does not want to advance. Okay, there we go. So definition of financial aid, it it's, is what it sounds like. It's funds provided to students, families to help pay for their post-secondary educational expenses. Um, the timeline, typically it works like this. You're gonna figure out all the schools that you wanna to apply to admission-wise. So you're gonna be applying for admission. 
probably about that same time, you're going to be applying for financial aid. And you might have heard of the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. If you're a domestic student, international student, you wouldn't um, complete a FAFSA application. But you might have heard of other applications that that particular college might require. So we're going to talk about things like institutional aid applications or maybe something called the CSS profile. Um, so you'll complete those applications, whatever's required of that school. And then the school will um, determine if you're going to be admitted. So you'll be notified of your admission. And then the financial aid office, if you are admitted, will determine your eligibility for aid and notify you of that. So that's kind of the timeline, kind of the, the sequence of events. And then if we're looking at the different big buckets of financial aid that you, um, that you may receive from a particular institution, there's aid that is based on your need. So that's the aid that we work with in the financial aid office. So we're looking at um, your income and your assets and the number of people in your family and that sort of thing. So that's all based on, your, on the financial need aspect. There's also something called non-need-based aid, and that would be the types of aid that have nothing to do with the family's financial um, situation. So breaking that down a little further um, into the types of aid. Um, sorry, my slides are not working quite the right way. Um, so the different types of aid that you might see, let's start with um, work. So there is, when you receive a financial aid award notification, which we're gonna talk about in just a bit, you might see these different kinds of financial aid on that award notification. So you might see something called student work or work study. That's an opportunity to work on campus. You might see a student loan might be part of your financial aid package. And it might be in the form of grants or scholarships as well. So we look at grants and scholarships as gift aid. There's, you receive that because you have financial need or maybe you have some meritorious ability of some sort. But loans and work are things that the student needs to do. The student needs to borrow the loan and repay it. And the student, for student work, the student will need to work hours in order to receive pay for that. But they all come together to form um, a financial aid package. So breaking it down a little bit into um, starting with scholarships money that does not need to be repaid unlike a loan so scholarship but when you see um, scholarship it's typically a merit scholarship so it's not based on financial need it's based on some kind of merit or skill or characteristic that the student has so maybe the student has some athletic ability and they are applying to and get um, admitted to a school that offers athletic scholarships or maybe it's based on a student gpa or their leadership in their high school community things like that anything really other than your financial need might be considered um, a merit scholarship the other type of gift aid um, that we talked about in addition to scholarships are grants. Again, still money that does not need to be repaid, but grants are typically awarded to students on the basis of their financial need. Again, it has nothing to do with GPA or uh, meritorious um, attributes, athletic ability. It's all strictly based on a student's demonstrated financial need. Um, and it's often called need-based aid. And just so you're aware, all of the um, aid that we offer at Reed um, comes in the form of grants, and it is um, all based on financial need um, here at Reed. So we have scholarships, grants, loans, money that students or parents, if parents um, are interested in borrowing, they can borrow an educational loan as well to help pay for the educational expenses. Um, for students, repayment usually begins after you finish your education, after you're no longer enrolled. We always um, remind students only borrow what you really need in order to pay your bill um, and meet your expenses. And we do consider loans um, not necessarily a bad thing. Borrowing a lot of loan um, for an undergrad, undergraduate degree it's not a wise investment move, but borrowing um, reasonably uh, uh, and smartly, we do consider that as an investment um, in your future. So a little bit more on the student loan. Um, 
when you apply for financial aid and you complete that federal form, the FAFSA, um, that's also your, um, that's how we tell if you're eligible for a federal loan, if you meet the federal loan um, eligibility criteria. And basically students, even though you might be 17 or 18, or even 16 years old, you're gonna qualify for a federal student loan um, because you are enrolled in college in a degree seeking program. So you don't need to find a credit worthy co-signer. It's a loan that's made between you and the federal government where you agree that you're gonna use these loan proceeds to help pay for your educational expenses. A um, little bit on the interest rate and things like that on the slide, but we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that right now. Um, and then there, there are other loans that students can borrow. They're called private or alternative loans. Um, these are loans that are offered by um, private lenders. So maybe US Bank or Wells Fargo or something like that. Um, now these loans do have um, different interest rate structures. They're not federally subsidized by the government. They will require a credit worthy co-signer, um, et cetera. So we always, um, tell students borrow, if you're provided with a financial aid package and you, you're needing additional money, always look at your federal loan option first. It's a safer option, there's deferment options and things like that. Um, and I would say before you consider a private or alternative loan, um, I would talk to the people in, in the financial aid office to find out more specifically, just so you're aware of the um, terms and conditions and, and uh, what those loans might involve. So those are for students. And, get, and then again, a parent can borrow something called a parent, uh, parent loan for undergraduate student or PLUS loan um, for their dependent student. Uh, those go through the federal government as well. Uh, parents can borrow up to how much the school costs, less any other types of financial aid. Uh, different from a student loan in that a credit check is required. Um, and for these types of loans, um, repayment usually begins while the student is still enrolled. Unlike the student loans, you're gonna start paying those back after you graduate. Okay. And then our last type of aid um, is student employment or student work or work study, you might um, see it called. But basically what this is, it's typically a job on campus and it allows a student to earn money. Um, uh, to help pay for their educational expenses. The student receives a paycheck. Um, and unlike the grants and scholarships that are just going to be applied directly to your um, student bill at the college, typically these are funds that a student you know, works, does their timesheet, gets paid, and then the money is typically uh, deposited into your, into your bank account and students can use that for their um, other educational expenses, maybe your books and supplies, personal expenses and things like that. So we have those buckets and then where does this money all come from? Um, some students will uh, find resources on their own through uh, private scholarships, uh, so uh, private sources. So students um, in high school, uh, typically to find these uh, private or outside scholarships, we, we like to recommend to students um, that they first consult with their high school guidance counselor. That's typically a really good resource for you to find out where, um, what scholarships students at your particular high school have received in the past. I mean, you can make it more targeted. Um, there's some free sites and things out there for students to look at, but what, what we mostly experience is students finding these opportunities um, through a connection with their high school. My only caution on private scholarship um, searches, I would say um, I've never seen an agency where you paid a fee, where you paid somebody, they've got some um, consulting business or whatever, where you, you pay them um, a sum of money and they promise to provide you with scholarship opportunities. Um, I would just caution you against maybe getting into something like that. Um, the, the information that you need is free and available. Um, and I have yet to see a student who's come up with um, some funding uh, after they've paid um, a, a company or a consulting firm to search that out for them. Um, the state may provide financial assistance to um, students. Typically, um, it's going to be uh, the state that you live in 
in is going to give you maybe uh, maybe they have scholarship opportunities or grant opportunities if you attend a school within that state. So like Oregon's got a, a, a state grant program that would be applicable only to students who um, attend, a, attend college and are graduated from an Oregon high school, live in Oregon and attend an Oregon college. But that can vary state by state. Um, the federal government also provides a lot of financial assistance. Um, the majority of that comes in the form of those federal loans that um, I was talking about, the student loan and the parent loan. Uh, the federal government does also provide uh, what's called the federal Pell Grant to um, students with a lot of financial need. Um, but the biggest source of um, financial aid in the form of grants and scholarships comes from the institutions themselves. So that's a little bit about where that money actually comes from, but it all comes together to form um, financial aid regardless of, of where that, that money actually comes from. So stepping back a little bit to the application. So the free application for federal student aid is the FAFSA. And again, this is for um, domestic students. US citizens um, would complete a free application for federal student aid. Um, so that one's gonna be required for uh, all institutions that you're applying to, if you're applying for financial aid and you're a domestic student. Um, depending upon the college though, they may also require an additional aid application um, called the CSS profile. Now, again, this is only required at some colleges and I'm gonna talk about that coming up in a bit, um, but the, the um, institution may also require their own aid application, or maybe um, specifically if it's for an institution that offers merit scholarships, there may be some additional applications for you to complete um, if, you, if it's a school that offers merit and you're applying for merit scholarships. So all that to say, just make sure that you know when you're looking at the different schools, look at their website, find out what's required um, and when it is due. That's the best way to figure out what you need to do. Um, so a little bit more about the FAFSA. This is again, the federal form. It's gonna collect information that um, is gonna be used to calculate something called your expected family contribution. I wouldn't get too hung up on that number. It's, that number is really just an indicator for the college to, to know if maybe you uh, qualify for a federal Pell Grant. Um, it's the number that we use to figure out if you, um, your federal loan that your all students are eligible for, but whether or not it'll be uh, subsidized, which means the government pays interest on that loan while you're in school, or it won't be subsidized. Um, some schools do use it to award their own institutional aid. Um, in the cases of divorced or separated parents, um, and this information I'm providing to you is um, applicable for students that are applying for financial aid for the 22-23 school year. Um, there's been some changes with the FAFSA Simplification um, Act that has gone into place, but those changes are typically gonna be happening, happening when students apply in the 24-25 school year. So I'm gonna just focus on um, if you're applying for aid in 22-23 or 23-24. Um, these are the current rules. So divorced or separated parents, um, when you're completing a FAFSA, you do a FAFSA uh, reporting the information. Currently, it's uh, for the parent with whom you've lived the most during the past 12 months. Um, and again, this information is used by colleges determining to determine your eligibility for federal funds, probably state funds, and it might be used for their institutional funds as well. Um, and you sign this form, it's an electronic application. Um, you do it once, um, one time, and you send it to the various schools that you want to have received the results. So you go out to the FAFSA site, you complete it, you sign it electronically with something called your FSA ID. So uh, that happens. And then, um, then all of the colleges receive that information electronically. So you don't have to do one FAFSA for the school, one FAFSA for the other school. It's one FAFSA, send it off to, to all the schools that you are applying to. You're gonna sign it electronically. Um, and uh, that, that FSA ID that you're going to be using to sign, you're gonna use it through your whole 
college career. Um, and every year you're going to do a FAFSA. You're going to apply annually for financial aid at the school. It's, it's a little bit more difficult. And I wouldn't even say difficult. It's going to be more time consuming your first year that you're doing FAFSAs. But your subsequent years for your sophomore, junior, senior years of college, um, a lot of the data is carried forward uh, for you. You can pull in data from the IRS. So it's if you get through the first year, that's kind of your learning curve. And it, it does get easier easier um, going through, but there's a lot of um, skip logic and simplification built into that FAFSA too. So um, it's probably not as um, difficult or nightmarish as you might have, have heard about. Um, so again, you're gonna use this throughout your whole college um, student and um, uh, one parent will need to, whoever parent is reported on the uh, FAFSA application will also need to get an FSA ID um, and they sign that electronically. Um, parents, if you have other students and you already have an FSA ID, you use the same one for all of your children. Um, so students and parents, you're going to want to make sure that you keep that username and password secure and safe. Um, it's your application, it's your signature for your federal aid applications. It's also going to be your signature if you do borrow um, through any federal loan programs. So make sure that you keep that um, safe and secure. So that's the FAFSA. Again, you're going to do that domestic students. You're going to complete that for all the colleges that you're applying to. Now, depending upon the school, the school may also require something called the CSS profile. Reed is one of those schools that does require this um, application as well. Um, you will find it's about 400 colleges now that require the CSS profile, but they're going to typically be private, higher cost, more selective, and it's typically a school that meets full financial need. So what that means is, and I'm gonna talk about meeting need in a, in a minute, but we're looking at um, providing as much aid as possible to students meeting their full need, while also needing to look deeper into a family's financial situation than a couple of data points that the FAFSA provides for us. So in the CSS profile, it um, will allow families to tell the school more about their financial commitments. There's places for uh, students to tell us about uh, medical expenses or income changes, uh, private school tuition that they're paying for, um, for other children. If there's other siblings that are attending college, you can tell us where that student is going and how much parents are, are paying out of pocket for that particular student. Uh, divorced or separated parents, we're going to have both parents complete a CSS pro profile. Uh, we're going to look at both biological parents when we um, assess our ability to provide institutional aid to families. There's a fee for the CSS profile um, that um, will be charged through the application process. Um, unless based on the information um, you provide, you might be provided with a waiver uh, for low income students as you do go through the application based on some income uh, questions that are asked, um, you will qualify for a waiver and then the, that student would not be required to make any, any payments and would be able to send their information. The same as the FAFSA, again, you're gonna go out and do one CSS profile and list the different colleges that you want to have receive that information. And then, just so you know, if you're um, going to be starting your senior year um, in high school, the first day that the FAFSA and the CSS profile for the um, upcoming academic year for the 22-23 academic year um, will be October 1st. So that would be the, the very first day that you could go out and complete um, a FAFSA or a CSS profile, again, if, if that's required. And just to give you an idea, these are old dates, but I wanted to show you, this is what you'll see on all, pretty much all colleges website. What are the deadlines to complete the application process? So here at Reed for this, um, for this school year, this admission cycle we've just been through, um, we would want our students who are, let's say applying regular decision, we would want them to have their CSS profile and their FAFSA application completed by January 15. And then we do require incoming students and, and some colleges do also require um, 
full tap, full set of taxes and W-2s and things like that. So we, we have a deadline for that as well. We give them an extra week because sometimes it takes a little bit to you know, pull all that information together. So um, this is just an example of what it might look like at a particular college. What I would caution you, it is available, FAFSA and Profile are available on October 1st. Um, you would maybe want to check with um, your state. Sometimes states have priority deadlines as well, so, so I would pay attention to that too. But, but at, at Reed and other schools, our institutional financial aid, it doesn't matter if we get your uh, FAFSA and profile on October 1st or uh, January 15th. You're still treated the same in your, your financial need is still the same. There's not like bonus points or extra points if you did it in October versus January. Um, but do pay attention to other schools deadlines to make sure that you don't miss a deadline. Okay, then a little bit more about meeting need. So I mentioned that Reed is a college that meets full demonstrated need. And this is what this means. We look at how much it costs to attend a year at Reed or any college, we subtract from that what the family is expected to contribute, the student and the parent. This, we do believe that the primary responsibility for paying for college lies with the student and the parent. But in those cases where there is a gap between the cost and the family's expected contribution, and that difference is called financial need. So what we're going to try to do is meet your financial need. So breaking it down a little bit into cost of attendance. So we all know tuition, fees, room and board, all of the things that you think about, they're, they're going to be on your bill if you're living on campus with room and board, things like that. But there's also indirect costs that aren't going to appear on your bill, that you're going to need to purchase textbooks, you're going to need to have your supplies, you're going to need to uh, get back and forth from campus. If you're applying to a college on the other side of the country, you're going to have to factor in some transportation expenses to get you back and forth. Um, if you don't live on campus, if you're living off campus in an apartment, buying your own groceries, things like that, you will have those expenses too. So we want to look at that full big picture, those direct and indirect costs are combined when we're looking at the full cost of attendance. And of course, that's going to vary widely depending upon the college that you are looking at. And then that other piece, we have cost, and then we subtract from that your federal contri your family contribution, basically. Um, and so what that is, it's a measurement of the student and the family's ability to pay. Um, it is broken down into a student contribution and a parent contribution. Um, it's calculated using that FAFSA data. I'm just going to talk about the federal formula now from the FAFSA. FAFSA data, it's a federal formula. Um, and it's pretty much going to stay the same from school to school when you're looking at various colleges. Um, it's always going to look at parent and student income. It's always going to look at the number of people in that student's household. For now, it's going to look at the number of children that are in college. And it's always going to look at student assets. Those are things that for every family, that's going to be considered. Depending upon the situation, it may consider parent assets. So that's going to be depending upon the income level. So if an income level is below a certain point in the federal formula, um, assets are not considered at all um, in the calculation of the contribution. And I think it's always good for, for parents to understand too when we're thinking about parent assets. Um, for the federal formula, um, home equity is not considered an asset um, for federal aid. Uh, and the, uh, the value of your retirement accounts. So those two things are totally off the table um, as assets. So it's really looking at investments. If you have 529 plans, uh, savings and things of that nature. Um, the, formula, the federal formula does not look at your, your financial commitments. It doesn't look at credit card debt or how much you pay in a mortgage, things like that. It's really um, pretty strict on looking at your adjusted gross income, taxes paid, and, and those sorts of things. A little bit about cost varying from schools. You can see in this example that we have um, a higher cost private school, a four-year public, and a community college. A lot of variation in the cost. 
family contribution in this example is $10,000. So that's gonna be um, pretty even straight across the board, but the student's financial need varies substantially in order to attend uh, each of these different types of schools. So this particular student would need, in addition to the family's contribution, they would need about $3,000 to cover their cost of attendance at um, a community college or 16,000 at a four year and um, much higher at a, um, at a oh, sorry, at a private school. Um, so again, um, meeting financial need, when we look at that, so I said Reed is a school that meets financial need. So what we would do here at Reed is we would put your financial aid package together um, if you were the sample family, um, and we would meet your full need with um, a Reed grant. Maybe there's, if you're a low-income student, maybe there's a Pell grant in there as well. Um, a, a small work award and a minimal federal loan. So that's how we meet need um, at Reed. Um, there's only about 60 colleges across the country um, who do meet full demonstrated need, um, have the resources, have that as their philosophy that that's um, how they will award their, their limited aid dollars. So there's about 60 of us that, that meet need. Um, the rest of the schools um, in those cases, they you might see a gap in your financial financial aid package, where in addition to that family contribution that you would need to come up with, um, there might be a gap in the funding too that you would um, uh, need to uh, cover as well in addition to the, um, the family contribution. So I think that's all well and good to understand that now, but you know, the FAFSA, you're not gonna do that till October. What might be a better way for you to figure out what might it cost to go to a, a certain school? So I think the best thing that you can do now at this point in your cycle is to look at the, um, the net price calculators. Every college is required to have one on their website. Um, and what this will provide for you is your net price. So ignore the sticker price, ignore, you know, read $75,000. Um, what might it cost me to attend? So you'll complete this calculator. It's not as extensive as a FAFSA or a CSS profile. It will ask you a few questions, um, but what you'll find out is what students with similar financial backgrounds, financial situations as yourself, what they paid out of pocket last year to attend Reed. So it will focus on that. It won't focus on the sticker price. It's going to focus on that net price. What's left? The sticker price minus grants and scholarships. That's your net price. That's what you really want to start comparing across the board um, when you're looking at other schools. So it really, it gives you an idea of what you might be able to expect. Again, it's an estimate. And if you have questions when you complete it and you're not sure what these results mean, reach out to the financial aid office and we're happy to walk through that. Make sure you put in the right information and kind of talk that through if you have questions. And especially at this point, it really does help to give you an idea of what you might be paying for college. It also helps you to compare different colleges. Maybe it widens your choice of schools that you're looking at. Okay, so you've applied for admission, you've applied for aid. Um, the admission office has told the financial aid uh, folks that you've been admitted, you've done all your applications. What we're gonna do on our end is provide you with a financial aid award notification. Um, sometimes it's called a package notification, an award announcement. Um, it might be sent to you electronically via email. It might come in uh, paper copy, mailed to your home address. Um, here at Reed, we like to do both. We like to get that email out to students right away because we know you're anxiously awaiting that information. So we send it in the form of an email, but we also follow up with a packet of information for the student. And then if there's parents involved in this, then they can actually look through the, the information. We include more information there on um, loans. We put information in on how to you know, calculate your net price. Uh, information about payment plans, financing options, and things like that. So there's lots of information in there. I would say to look at them carefully. 
not, there's no standard format. So you're not gonna get an aid award letter from Reed that's gonna match, look exactly like other schools that you might be applying to. So um, just be careful of that. Make sure when you're looking at your net price that you're, you're subtracting out just the grants and scholarships, whatever they've put in your aid award that's called a loan or work award. Kind of, I mean, that's important. Those are good financing tools, options, but really focus on uh, the grants and scholarships um, at that point to get yourself to that net price. Then a little bit about um, special circumstances, then we'll hop into our questions. I see we have a few in the chat. Um, so if you've done these applications, um, well, CSS Profile does give you an option, opportunities to tell us more about what's really happening in your family. Um, but things sometimes change even after students have completed their applications. Things that aren't really, you don't feel accurately reflect uh, the information that you've provided on your, uh, maybe your FAFSA or um, CSS profile. But what you wanna do, I would just say, um, reach out to the financial aid office. You can't just do a general request to FAFSA or a general request on your CSS profile. If, if you've got some changes, I think the best way is to um, email or call the financial aid office and say, hey, something's changed and we did all of this and, and my, my parents lost a job, you know, different things like that. There's been so much with COVID and all of that. So how do I best tell you about that? So they might walk you through the process. They might um, per, um, direct you to a link on their website about how to complete this request for reconsideration or appeal process or something like that. So they might ask for additional um, documentation. Um, here at Reed, if a parent's had a job loss, we might ask for a copy of the if there's a severance package, unemployment benefits, um, notice of whatever. Um, so we'll ask for that. And then um, depending upon where we are in our budget cycle and things like that, we might be able to make adjustments for families based on uh, based on changes. So just know that that's something that you, um, if you have had a change to reach out to the financial aid office. So um, they're aware that um, you've had a change in your uh, situation. So there I talked so quickly. Um, I think what I'll do now is I'll pop into the chat, but if anybody just wants to come off mute and ask a question too, um, that's a really good way to do it. So you can maybe hear a different voice other than mine for the last, oh my gosh, I talked for 37 minutes. Um, okay, so our first question is, does Reed take home equity into account? Um, for our institutional aid, we ask for the value of a, a parent's home minus the debt. And it's a question on the CSS profile. At the institutional level, we can treat that um, any way we, we choose to. Um, so a school might use um, uh, options where in certain situations, depending upon, let's say we might look at that and maybe a family has a lot of home equity. Uh, maybe they live in a high cost area, but, their income is such that, you know, this is maybe what they've been setting aside as a retirement, that sort of thing. They tell us more about that. Um, we, yes, we do ask it, um, but we can look at that in various ways because we're looking at our own institutional money and our own institutional policies. We, we're not bound by any kind of a, a federal um, mandate on how to handle um, home equity. And it, even if it is taken into account, um, there are various asset protection allowances, savings allowances, and things that go against it. But, but to answer the question, yes, we ask it, and it may be taken into account. Um, should tax documents be from 2019 or 2020 for us? Um, if, you're, okay. if you are a student who is applying um, for financial aid for the 22-23 academic year, you will be providing you and your parents taxes from 2020. So if you're a senior in high school, it'll be based on 2020. Um, and that's what the, the FAFSA will base it on 2020. Um, if you're applying to a school like Reed that requires a CSS profile, we are going to ask on the CSS profile, ask for 2020, that's the base of the application. But we also ask, um, 
uh, what happened in 2021 and what's happening right now for you in 2022. Um, what if my parents are non-tax filers? Okay, those are two because they are self-employed. Okay, so non-tax filers, uh, they're self-employed people who are required to file tax returns. So just to put that out there, but there are some people for whom their income doesn't meet the level that they're required to file a tax return. And then you would just indicate that on the application that they're non-tax filers, not required to file a tax return. And then it just asks for income information. Um, yep, okay. Um, so how much weight do parents assets and retirement hold for CSS profile. Uh, okay, so parent assets um, on the CSS profile, um, I, we talked about retire value of retirement accounts. It's a question that's asked on the CSS profile, but it's not part of the formula. So what we, the reason we like that question is if I'm reviewing, a, it's called file review. We look at every single application for students who are admitted, we're going through them. Um, I might look at that and say there's a lot of home equity income is this level, um, but they, they've been in professions where they haven't been able to have take advantage of a 401k or a 403b or the, the retirement value isn't maybe where um, might be comfortable for a parent based on that age. So again, it's asked, but it's not part of the formula. We talked about home equity, asked, and maybe part of the analysis that we're using. And again, but that the retirement is pretty much off the board at all schools, but every college that's requiring the profile and is asking home equity, they can have their own ways of treating um, that as an asset. Um, and then I think it's really good to, to know too that you're, when you're looking at, you're looking at the net worth, but you're also then, and income. So income protection allowances, allowances for taxes, allowance for medical, allowances for assuming that families have been saving for their children throughout the year. So we give allowances based on the presumption that you are, you've been saving and that you don't have, um, you know, we've taken another allowance for that. Um, there's allowances based on, on the CSS profile, um, uh, cost of living adjustments. So for families that are living in high cost areas, they have different income and asset protection allowances um, than maybe a student living in you know, a rural community in Iowa or something like that. Um, let's see, can a student use a parent's post 9-11 GI bill that has been transferred to them? If so, does re participate in the post 9-11 GI bill yellow ribbon program? Um, yes, we do participate in that program. Um, we have spaces for 15 students. Um, and I would say if you're applying to Reed or any other school and you're interested in that, reach out to, um, usually every school has a VA certifying official or um, the financial aid office to find out how you can get on a waiting list um, for that. So if you've applied for admission, um, then you want to make sure then if you're planning to use that to you know, find out if the school does provide that benefit. And then if so, um, how do you if how you get on the list of students and um, to maximize. So every year at the end of the year, we see how many of our students who have the benefit are graduating and then how many more we have room for coming in. Um, so if my family's financial situation stayed the same each successive year, I would apply for financial aid at Reed. Would the demonstrated financial need and EFC stay the same? Um, yes, yeah, so you're gonna apply every year. So um, what we do at Reed, again, could be different at, at each schools, is our goal is to keep your aid package as consistent as possible from year to year. Yes, you apply every year. Um, but if there are significant changes in your financial situation, um, then that can have an effect on your eligibility for need-based aid um, both ways. So uh, let's say you start off and um, family's making a certain amount of money and then within, you know, two years later, it's, it's bumping up 30, 40, 50,000. That can have an impact, but the other way as well. So maybe, um, 
the first year your family was making a certain dollar amount and then parents have earned less throughout that time, it can, it can go the other way too. But what we really try to do in the vast majority of cases, although with COVID that's not really true anymore, before COVID families were pretty consistent throughout the four years, um, but we have had uh, many families of course that have um, suffered uh, financially through the pandemic where their need has actually um, increased over the years. Um, let's see. I think I got all those. Do we have anybody that wants to ask a real life question? Oh, I'm anything that I answered already that maybe still seems unclear it can be provide more clarification. Awesome. Oh, could you talk about appeals? What kind of reasons or circumstances are considered? Thanks. That's a really good question, Terry. Um, so appeals, the process, the whole how to do it, when to do it can vary from school to school. Um, so what we do at Reed is um, we we go out with our strongest aid package possible. So based on the information we have using our uh, formulas and our philosophy to treat families equitably and fairly so that families in similar financial situations have similar financial aid packages um, as other students. So we're, we're gonna go out with the, um, the strongest aid package possible. However, if things have changed um, since your aid applications were completed, um, we have something called a request for reconsideration process. And it's outlined pretty well, I think, on our website. Um, but I think the best thing to do is call. And we, our financial aid team, will walk you through the situation and tell us more about what's going on. Um, oh, it's been a job loss. OK, here's what we need. This is what we want you to do. Do this form. You're going to submit this, upload it to our secure portal. We'll kind of walk you through that. So what we would do in our office in that situation, it would be things like um, job loss, um, uh, families with unusually high medical uh, or dental expenses that aren't already considered in the formula. The formula's got some of that already built into it, but if it's above what's already in the formula, we might ask for documentation on that. We might be able to take that into consideration. Um, those are probably two of the biggest um, reduction in hours, uh, but certainly in the last year, um, uh, income reductions with um, layoffs and things like that I would, would typically be uh, what we would be looking at as um, uh, something that we would try our best to be able to help the family um, out with. Um, that said, there could be schools that we don't negotiate at Reed, so, um, but there, there could be schools that, that would possibly go through that negotiation process where you could call them up and say, hey, I got a merit scholarship for $20,000 at whatever college. Um, I want you to match that. And can you match that? Um, that sort of thing. Um, I'm not just, that's not to say that, that that does happen. And other kinds of, especially schools that offer merit scholarships, there might be, you know, more flexibility with that. It also depends on where they are with their enrollment numbers for the year, um, how willing they might be to negotiate. So I always tell families, you know, in that case, it, it doesn't hurt, but here's how it, it works at Reed. We wouldn't negotiate. Um, we don't compare aid uh, packages uh, with other schools. So, um, so yeah, that's how we handle it here, but I think it varies school by school and um, it really doesn't hurt to appeal if, if that's something you, but if you have something definitely, we call it appeal worthy, like it's been, because we're only need based, it's your, your need, your, your finances have changed. Then tell us about that and that's what we're gonna work with here. Um, let's see, appeals. If we have a second home in that, is that considered same as a primary residence? Um, no, a second home on both the FAFSA and the CSS profile are considered an, an asset that will be reported. So it's the value of the home less any mortgage that's owed on that um, residence that's considered um, as an asset on both the FAFSA and the CSS profile.
Very good. Oh. Um, in a significant change on income from 2020 to 2021, what is the best way to inform without calling? Um, if you're if you're a prospective student, um, well, either, it doesn't matter. I would email the financial aid office um, and let them know that you've had a change and they can provide you with um, next steps. Um, if you're a, you know, a already enrolled student at our school, um, then you would, you would call us or I'm sorry, email us and we would walk you through the, the process um, and let you know what you need to do in order to be um, considered for additional assistance. Great. You're very welcome. Well, thank you everybody for taking time. I was going to say this afternoon, but I don't know where, is it evening, whatever, uh, where you may be, but best of luck to you in your um, college search process. Um, it uh, it can be kind of daunting, but um, through all of the, the programs and things that we're providing here at Reed, as well as the other schools, financial aid, admission, just reach out to these schools. We are excited to work with you. Um, if you have Reed specific questions, just email our general financial aid email account, and we will be happy to get back with you and walk you through um, whatever um, questions or concerns that you might have. So great. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.